Hello, I'm Willie George. I want to welcome you to this edition of the Faith Roots Podcast, and we're studying Psalm 19. And it's such a rich psalm, and I'm actually only going to get to nine verses in this psalm, uh, but it, it, it's so instructive. And what we've talked about is how that God's Word, and He uses different uh, words to describe His Word. He talks about His commandments or His ways, uh, His testimonies or His stories, His statutes are His boundaries. Then there is the little finger, the commandments and the instructions. Uh, then there is the fear of the Lord, and then there are the judgments of the Lord. And all of these are different. Now, scientists will tell us that if we did not have, as humans, an opposable thumb, we would still be living in the Stone Age. The opposable thumb is one of the most amazing creations in the human body. The fact that we have this strong, strong muscle here, that separates and attaches to the thumb and gives it the power, it allows us to have this amazing grip. And the thumb is compared to judgment. Uh, we call it an opposable thumb, meaning uh, opposable means two. You've got one force here, one force here. And that's, that's why I use the thumb as a symbol for judgment, because judgment is the ability to separate two things and to choose what is superior. And a lot of people have no judgment. In fact, judgment is the, really the last thing that we develop as believers who walk with God. Uh, we don't develop judgment right away. It takes us a little while to develop judgment. In fact, a lot of us are afraid of judgment. I will explain that because we are so caught up with this idea of acceptance. And it's good. It's good that we believe that God wants to accept us. But at the same time, God also has this thing in him called judgment. And you won't appreciate it till you've walked with God for a while. You'll realize how important judgment is, the right kind of judgment. So judgment is the ability to filter between two ideas. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. In other words, God's judgments, when they're right, they're good. Uh, however, I would say this, judgment in a human being is not anger. Uh, the Bible says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. A lot of times we associate uh, judgment with somebody being really ticked off and mad. And God does have an anger. But when God is angry, it's always righteous. And I will say this, God never moves in judgment except for the purposes of redemption. You know, people look at the story of Pharaoh at the Red Sea and how God judged the Egyptian armies and, and uh, uh, allowed them to drown in the Red Sea. And they, they look at that as a harsh thing. A lot of people are afraid of that God. But when you stop and think about the whole situation, God only did that because Pharaoh was determined to kill those innocent people who had been locked in slavery for hundreds of years. And he was determined to wipe them out. He didn't want to let them go. One time I told the Lord, Lord, I'd have had the Red Sea all rolled back. I'd have had Pharaoh come up to an empty seashore and all the people were gone. And he answered me and he said, yes, and you would have had to drown the Egyptian army in the sand about a month later. Pharaoh was that determined. He was going to track down these people no matter where they were. So you see that act of judgment in the Red Sea was really also at the same time an act of mercy. And that's how God's judgment works. Every real act of judgment is also an act of mercy. It may not be mercy for the person who's being judged, but it is mercy for someone else. We assume that God can only deal uh, with righteous people, but He has to deal with wicked people as well. And when He does deal with wicked people, it is for the sake of the righteous. And that's so very important to get. That's why judgment makes sense. And I want to talk about judgment for a little bit. I didn't have a lot of judgment when I first began to walk with God. I believed that I could win anybody. I believed that every person, that if I could just get with them and talk to them, I could turn anybody. I could have a big impact on them. And I did win a lot of people to Christ. One night I was driving back into the small town where I worked. It was in the cold wintertime. And I saw a hitchhiker on the side of the road, a guy about my age. He's, I had long, long hair, one of those old army coats that a lot of kids wore in those days and big old boots, and had a backpack. And so I pulled over and said, where are you going? He said, I'm, I'm going south in Texas down Highway 83. 
And I said, well, do you have a place to spend the night? Where are you sleeping? He said, I sleep out in the ditches. And I said, you don't need to sleep in the ditches. Get in here. So I, I got him in my car, and I took him into town. I got him a hamburger and fed him supper that night. And then I took him over to a building on our town square. It was our coffee house, and we used it to minister to teenagers every Saturday night. And it was a little bit of a headquarters for our youth group. And two doors down, there was a donut shop. And one of the men in our church ran that donut shop. And so we had an account there. And so I told him, I said, you can stay in this coffee house tonight. When you get up in the morning, just go down to the donut shop and uh, charge your donuts. Uh, tell them there that uh, you want this, and I'll go down there and clear it, and they'll, they'll give them to you. And so, uh, sure enough, the next day I went down a little bit later and I saw that the door had been shut in the coffee house and I went to the donut shop and said, did he come? They said, yes, he did. And I, uh, I had witnessed to this young man. I did not lead him to Christ, but I took a little time to talk to him about the Lord. I showed him the kindness of the Lord. Well, several days passed. And so Saturday night came and it was time for us to, to start the service and all of our teenagers are filing in and I fire up the PA system and strum my guitar, and the microphone doesn't work. And so I look at the switch, I look at the connections, and it's plugged in. I can't figure out what's going on. I look over at the amplifier, and the red light's on, so I, I know the power's on. And so I strum it again, and nothing's happening. So I go to the back of the speaker box, and the amplifier's there, and I look for a connection. And sure enough, there's a connection between the amp and the speakers, and, but there's no sound coming out. So I flip over the speaker box where I can see up inside it, and I see that all of my speakers have been unscrewed and they've been removed. Now I know what happened. The guy that I got the hamburger for, that I allowed to sleep in that place, that I got the meal for the next morning, he unscrewed all of those speakers and he put them in his backpack and he took them down the road and he pawned them in the next town. Now, I learned a lesson from that. And it took me a few of those episodes. I'll tell you another one. I, got, I learned the same season. There was another kid who came to the service, and he made a beeline to me after the service, and he said, oh, man, I love the sound of that 12-string guitar. I love the sound of that 12-string guitar. He said, is there any way you could let me use your guitar this week? Well, I didn't play my guitar during the week. I had no real use for it that week. He said, please, I'll bring it back. I'm coming back next Saturday night. And I thought, well, this would be a way to get him back this Saturday night, so I'll let him use my guitar. I didn't know this kid. Never seen him before. He lived in another town. So the next Saturday night, youth service is about to start. I don't have a guitar. He doesn't show up. The following Saturday night, he doesn't show up again. I start asking some of the people he came with, well, we hadn't seen him. Oh, man, was I nervous. I finally drove to this little house, a farmhouse that was rented out in the middle of the boonies in another town, about 30, 35 miles away from where we lived, and I saw it was empty. I could tell that people had moved out, front door was standing wide open, so I went through that house, and in the back, oh, thank God, there in the back bedroom, under an old bed frame, was my guitar case, and I went over there and pulled it out, but I had a sinking feeling. I had something went right. I opened it up, and he had stomped my guitar into a hundred pieces. It was nothing. I thought, why would you do something like that? It was the devil. It really was. The devil used him to steal my 12-string guitar. And so it was a big deal with me. It affected me. And I learned something about that. I look back on it. It was a costly mistake, but I learned something. I trusted people to a level that they should never have been able to get to. I put all of our resources into the hands of a hitchhiker I knew nothing about. Now, it would not have been wrong for me to buy him a hamburger. It would not have been wrong had we had a place to stay where there was a warm place to sleep as long as there was someone there to supervise and to watch over our possessions. But in both cases, like this young man who took my guitar, I didn't know who he was. I'd never seen him before. He was not responsible to me. I didn't know his family. I didn't know where to find him. I had to go hunt for his house and ask where the family had lived. And so the thing of it is, I did not have good judgment. And I thought I could trust him. 
What I want you to see is people suffer for lack of judgment. And the judgment is like the opposable thumb. It works against the positive. It's the negative down here. And there are times when you have to go with the negative instead of the positives. And I should have said no, both cases. I should have not done those things. And I, I got burned because of this. And uh, I, I read a story here a few years ago about a girl here in the Tulsa area who was a wonderful girl, but she had this belief that she could win anyone to Christ, and she was constantly picking up hitchhikers. And her family had begged her, please don't do that, but she was certain that she could continue to pick them up with no harm. But one day she picked up the wrong guy and he killed her. And that's a lack of judgment. And we have these ideas that somehow I can... I can, I'm invincible, I'll, I'll be okay. But God's Word teaches us to exercise judgment at the appropriate times. Another story, a young man I, I knew a little bit. I knew his wife a lot better than I knew him. She had grown up in our church. Uh, they'd gotten married. He had been delivered from alcohol. He quit drinking. But he had a buddy that showed up one day at his place of work right as it was time to go home. And so he was wanting to go home. He lived in another town about 15, 20 miles away. And he knew when he put his head in the window of the car that the guy who was behind the wheel had been drinking. But he thought, ha, ah, it won't hurt. But sure enough, he got into the car. They had a rollover accident. He's the one who gets killed, leaves behind a new wife and a new baby. And the guy who was driving drunk doesn't really get hurt that bad lack of judgment. It is the ability to say no, no, no. And that's what God's Word gives us. It gives us the appropriate ability to say no. Now sometimes you don't say no, but when it's appropriate, saying no will save your life. So what Psalm 19 is teaching us is how to walk with God and teaching us that God has ways, God has stories, God has boundaries, God has instructions. But these things lead to a respect that helps us, and it develops in us this capacity for judgment, and that helps us to become mature and to fully know God. Well, that is all the time I have for this lesson, but we'll pick up here next week because there's more to come on the Book of Psalms. Thanks. Thanks.